a Friday morning at 10 a.m. and um, we're spread across the countryside today uh, in regional New South Wales and in Victoria. Welcome, Paul. And um, yeah, let's uh, jump into today's session, which I have made it all about insurance. So we're going to record this session because we know that there is a lot of different insurance at the moment. And I know we've discussed it, yes, connect and shares, but um, I think we've just got to reiterate some of the points around insurance and particularly in our industry where we are trying to do the best in our risk management. Um, and also to ensure that they know activity or a safe uh, industry to be part of. Um, so it goes hand in hand, but I won't jump into that just yet. Um, I will firstly acknowledge um, our traditional owners of which the lands of which we come from today and reiterate that um, it, it is incredibly uh, rewarding and important from a cultural perspective to engage your local Aboriginal peoples in your activities. And you'll see if you're attending the masterclass, which is on the 29th of March, in Canberra this year, there is a special section of that masterclass that's dedicated to understanding more about how our traditional owners uh, connect with the land and something that we can take um, a leaf out of their book on, on their connectivity to the land because we operate in it every day, every week. So, um, and I'll jump into more about the masterclass in just a, se in just a second, but um, acknowledge all our traditional owners from where we come from today. So the quick review on needs to know, need to know. So you would have received your membership newsletter last week, oh, sorry, earlier this week. And then the industry newsletter also went out, just reiterating some of the points and um, going to the broader industry. So uh, you would have seen that we've had a bit of a tension in the news, which is really pleasing uh, around some of our challenges as a sector, which we mentioned at the last Connect and Share um, around our border closures. So. Um, we were pleased to get some exposure in the Canberra Times. We've had various radio um, people, uh, pe uh, stations pick it up as well. So I've been interviewed um, on a few of those. And uh, it, we're getting the message out that we are a national industry, that we provide economic contribution right across the country, no matter where we are based. Uh, exhibit A, as we have every Friday, where we have people from other states join in and we connect. So um, by having this article, I think it's, it's just reinforcing um, our awareness as an industry, but also the fact that um, we do actually require some better system around these border closures, which we never thought were gonna be a, an issue we'd have to conquer in 2019, but uh, certainly do now in 2021. Um, okay, so the other need to know is, well, Year of the Ox is on the horizon. So as of the uh, the 14th of February, which is also Valentine's Day, we have the Year of the Ox commencing. And, and that year, when I looked at all of the, the meanings behind what 2021 is going to mean, it was very much about discipline, um, very much about economic recovery, funny enough. Um, and it was also just um, looking at your time better spent. So uh, time management is a big uh, thing for this year in the, the horoscopes of the Chinese um, realm. So I think with that, we say no change is really no improvement. So we know that we've set about achieving some uh, goals this year and uh, using our industry and connecting with our industry to get those results happening. So the first one is the Trial Bike Subcommittee, which we met this week, and uh, we are really connecting with the stakeholders in this area and trying to engage with each of the landholders, as well as local members, as well as councils on their position regarding trial bikes to get a good assessment of where we're sitting or a status um, until we get that, then we can start going and working with them on better results for trial bike riders. And that's not necessarily just um, opening 
up trails for trail bikes. It's actually understanding the benefits of trail bike riding. It's looking at the economy of trail bike riding and working with councils to allow different areas of their, their council um, access, but also making sure that we work in harmony with other activities because we know from the, light, the survey we did through the trail bike committee, which I will present one, um, uh, one day at the Connect and Share, it really harnesses the, the mental health aspect. People who are participating in this event uh, or this activity um, have great mental health um, benefits associated and there's economic benefits for council areas as well. The risk management subcommittee update is that we, um, we're working on the severe weather guidance note and we hope to have that available in the coming weeks. That way we'll get it to the industry so that you can start looking at that in your, your processes and procedures. The call for the mountain bike subcommittee. So another subcommittee that we're looking at because there is quite a few different areas, uh, local council areas that are looking at mountain bike and um, activities and how they manage it and how they work with the community on it. And we think that Outdoors New South Wales and ACT has a great um, opportunity to help lead some of those discussions or help bring parties together for the best outcome in that area. So uh, if you're interested, if you're experienced in mountain biking, you have a good understanding of its requirements requirements, this is a great opportunity for you to, to jump on to our mountain bike subcommittee. The other call we had out in the newsletter uh, this week was for AAAS auditors and I will talk a little bit more on that in a minute because today's topic is all about why we are doing this. So hang, hang two minutes on that one. The reminder about the Outdoor Masterclass, so the 29th of March in Canberra at the Southern Cross Club, it is a full day commitment, um, but at no cost to members. Now I have opened up a few more spots. We did reach capacity. I've spoken with the, um, the, the venue and said, can we squeeze a few more in with um, the COVID restrictions uh, now being reduced uh, to which they have responded yes. So if you haven't RSVP yet, and you do want to attend that masterclass, I urge you to probably contact me today um, or very early next week if, they, if they're not already sold out. So um, please get in touch if you want to attend that class. And again, reiterate, free for members. Um, and as of last night, um, I had the great news that we were successful in a grant provided by the ACT government um, to help uh, from the tourism department of ACT government to help boost uh, the awareness of our outdoor activities in Canberra and the ACT. So uh, I look forward to working with them on that grant and uh, hopefully getting some great results for our industry um, as the outcome. Connect and share topics. So today, as I said, is all about insurance. Um, unfortunately, uh, Chris can't make it today, but uh, he is certainly wanting to come and talk to the outdoor educators or teachers about creating a separate network to help share ideas as they go through this year. But yeah, today will be all about um, insurance and uh, some of the challenges and how we get around those. Next week, uh, Take Three will join us about their pilot program. Now, this is a, a topic which really affects three particular areas, the South Coast, the Central Coast and the Coast Coast area uh, in trying to, they've got a, a grant that they're implementing a process on uh, rubbish recovery and also awareness. And they're using uh, tourism operators to help connect the messages. So they will be helping you in providing um, opportunities with your customers. Um, but yeah, if you come along next week, you'll hear a lot more about that. And um, yeah, don't miss it if you're located in the, any of those three areas. The next week after that is Exploria. And I think I mentioned this last week, but it's a great new app which is engaging visitors on another level and taking the gamification, which is one of the marketing uh, opportunities of today into a destination, into the outdoor world. So I think you'll, uh, you'll be keen to sort of get an understanding of how this could adapt to your business or your place. And then the, uh, the final one for February will be the update on the New South Wales Nature Place strategy. So you might remember that Sam Crosby from um, the Botanic Gardens has been working on the Nature Place strategy. We will have an update that will be able to be presented. Uh, I think that one will be the 26th of February. So the last one for February in, um, in our Connect and Shares. 
So a lot of information there. Please, if you've got any questions, um, stick your hand up, yell out, whatever, and um, I'm happy to address it or put it into the chat. Um, but that gives you a bit of a, a snapshot on, on where we're at today. So insurance, look, to get everyone on the, the same page, this is not anything I'm sure you all don't know, but just to reiterate that obviously the role of insurance is to help protect you financially or your business financially from any un unforeseen or uncertainties that may, may come across your circumstances. Um, insurance works by pulling together resources of many people with similar type of risks so that um, you know, it's a few people that might suffer losses and that could be covered by that pool. Um, but that's the simplified version. I'm sure Paul will take us through the more depth of how that actually works in just a minute. So what are you protecting? Um, well, it's obviously things like business assets, it's your customers, it's your employees, uh, business owners and the earnings that you get from that business. But remember that in Australia, you have compulsory insurances that you must take out. And that includes workers' compensation and public liability insurance. So they are your must-haves for any business in Australia. There are other insurances, of course, and you can cover for a whole multitude of different things, including whether um, professional indemnity is often recommended for people giving advice um, and business insurance, etc. So why are we having challenges? I'm going to hand over to the specialists in this area because I certainly can't talk to this as well as they can. Um, so I might hand over either to Paul or Greg, whoever wants to, to start. But um, just to both of you, I've spoken to a few organisations in the last couple of weeks who are renewing uh, their insurances and are really struggling at getting those renewals happening. Um, why is that the case? And, and please take us through why we're seeing some of these challenges at the moment. Thanks, Laurie. Um, it's Paul here. Uh, it's, it's interesting. There's a whole range of reasons why we're uh, having these challenges. And I think your intro was really good. If we look back on um, you know, the, the reasons why we have insurance, you know, the, for those of us who are over 21, um, it used to be that you know, in the event of, of something going wrong, um, that, that we would be either compensated for the losses we exist, we insure or that we're compensating for the losses of uh, others that, that have, uh, have been um, financially um, uh, disadvantaged or physically uh, emotionally disadvantaged. Um, and so, you know, we, we were doing this for this, you know, from a service model. Um, over time, a whole lot of different things have influenced what we do for insurance. And you mentioned all of the ranges of insurance. Uh, you know, interesting, you worked mentioned workers' compensation first. Um, a lot of people have made business choices. They've been advised, oh, look, you can save on this, or you can save on that if you hire contractors, for example. Uh, often, though, we don't actually investigate what are the insurance implications of that. Um, we'll get advice as to, you know, uh, uh, and make a business decision based on one facet without actually looking at uh, all of the other risks that are involved. Mm -hmm. So why are we facing the challenges? In reality, Laurie, I think we're facing the challenges because of a, a convergence of things. Um, one, uh, insurers right now are being hammered in every corner. We're seeing um, increased um, natural disasters and the occurrence of natural disasters, the increased cost of those natural disasters. We're seeing um, low financial returns on anything else. So typically insurers' earnings come from, I'll, I'll simplify it, but two sources, premium and financial investments. Um, their returns on investments at the moment are, you know, interest rates are zero. So they're relying on premium primarily for their returns. And given that most insurers are, are listed companies, they've got to provide returns for their shareholders, you know, the profitability of those things. So then they've got to choose between insuring areas that are profitable versus those that are not profitable. And they also have to make decisions about what's sustainable, um, you know, getting into markets that are not sustainable whilst short-term profitability is also fraught with risk for their own financial planning. So they are making business decisions and, they're looking very broadly at what the implications of those decisions are. They invest very heavily in, in their risk management processes. So on the one hand, you've got that and, and the convergence is then coming where you've got 
um, that similar environment which is putting pressure on other businesses. So you've got the, the, the business world, in, you know, we'll talk about our industry where the, out, the outdoors, the recreation and the adventure side of things, where we've got um, you know, the impact of COVID. We've got the impact of uh, all of the other business pressures that every other business is being, is being piled on. Plus you've got then the, the added thing that, that historically we have not really planned or structured. We, we typically have run our businesses from a lifestyle perspective um, and only in the last few years have, have really met most of the operators started to put more of a business focus. There is still a very large percentage of people in our industry um, that, that still are doing this from a lifetime experience. And it's, you know, you hear it often, oh, I don't make that much money. That's going to cost me too much. Um, so it's, you, know, you, you don't put the power on unless you know how much the power bill is. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we, we need to start to think a little bit more broadly in those terms. So all of those things are, imply, are, are, are adding to that complication. What's happening then is you've got a series of, of, of uh, claims that have been hitting our industry. And, you know, I think you're all aware of the, the high profile ones and they're all costing millions of dollars. You've got increased legal fees, which are all costing millions of dollars. Um, uh, and we've then got, got uh, you know, the, the fact that insurers are starting to scrutinise the industries that they're insuring. So, you know, without being harsh, I'm being very general, so please don't take it personally, anybody who's on the call, but I think we can all relate to typically we're looking at an industry where, um, you know, insurance is a must have, so it's a forced buy. It's not something people have budgeted for or considered until you know, recently, and it's a grudge buy. They, they sort of say, oh, why? Um, the, the other part is that they've made a whole lot of business decisions that all of a sudden, you know, Greg, uh, who's, who's got to try to you know, broker these sorts of deals out to the insurers, um, is trying to say, you know, the insurers are, are saying, okay, well, what about standards? Um, what, 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 uh, what are the risk management practices of the industry? What are the standards that are in place um, what evidence have we got that they're, that they're um, achieving? The AAS have been a huge step forwards in trying to get credibility amongst the insurers um, because all of a sudden industry is saying these are the expectations we have of what must be done within our industry. That self-regulation is viewed so much better than what's being told. But in the lack of a lot of that being presented to insurers, What's been happening is they're starting to look at, okay, uh, we'll write this business if these things are done. And insurers don't actually know what we do, but they look at the risk and they say, oh, there's been a zipline incident. All right, what are the standards for these types of things? They look through those standards um, and then they find Australian or international standards that go to it. And then they say, okay, well, we'll ensure this if these people comply with these standards. Now, if they're relevant, that's good. Um, unfortunately, oftentimes our industry still hasn't embraced those standards, so then we have to clamour to try to find it. But if they're not relevant, we've then got to work twice as hard to demonstrate why another standard should be applied because the insurer won't accept no standard. Mm. So that that's, uh, in a nutshell, I, I'm only focusing on one. There's a whole lot of other factors that are happening. And, and typically when there's any convergence, there's always more than one factor doing it. Those, in my view, uh, are the critical ones. There are a whole lot of other things we could add to it. But uh, I think critically, those are the major factors that are, that are influencing the issues we're having because insurers are saying, why would I be insuring this i've got to invest 20 million dollars you're asking me to you, you you've got you know premiums that are you know in the low thousands for multiple you know some businesses are earning you know, are turning over millions of dollars um and and on the other hand their insurance is is in the thousands of dollars and it's just not it's not in line with typical business operations of you know, some 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 industries are uh, you know sure they're at one one percent. Some businesses are at three percent. Some businesses are at five percent, and there are some businesses that are at ten percent. We've just been unrealistic in what we've been able to get away with, um, and insurers are pulling out of the market left, right, and centre because it's just not giving the returns. That's a really quick summary. No, that's and, I think, oh, and I think Paul, where you where you're talking about those, those low premiums is that. 
if it has been running in a severe deficit for a, for a period and it's been, let's say it needed to be 5,000 on average per business to be viable, but it ran at three for five years, well, the insurers have to then go, well, we need to run at seven, which is two over for the next three to five years to, to catch up, um, which they're probably not going to commit to three to five years. They're going to probably want it in a very short time. So then it results in large, uh, larger uh, corrections. Um, it's the seesaw yeah. is teetering back and forth very quickly. And, and what, what it appears that's happened is that if it's within um, a small amount that can be remediated from a pricing perspective, they can make a 20, 30% increase. And that's what we're seeing on average at a minimum currently. We're seeing, we're seeing risks that are priced 500% too low currently. Businesses that were paying thousands of dollars where comparable businesses have been paying tens of thousands from a viable perspective. And the insurers are going, this is just too far out of the ballpark for us to correct. And they're just backing out completely. So that's all those combinations, Laurie, that are, that are going through to it. And um, yeah, yeah it, it's a, it, it is a complex environment. Yeah, so Rob's actually made a really good point. And I was gonna ask a very similar question. Um, my question was going to be, has anyone been denied insurance if they're following the AAAS guidelines? Um, it, it, it's to say that have they been denied insurance? I can't answer that question um, straight off the bat. But uh, what I can say is that any activity that has got adventure activity standards, um, certainly with our insurer, um, there is uh, it, it is a whole lot easier to place that. Um, when we can demonstrate. Now, remember, um, having the AAS is one thing, being able to demonstrate that they're complying with it. And uh, it leads me to another sort of sideline. So, so in other words, the answer is yes, it's made a huge impact because those activities have, have already got a tick. We then have to demonstrate that we are complying with them, but at least we've got those activities ticked off. Um, this, the, the, the complexity of, you know, we've, we've introduced things like um, uh, the, the, um, uh, tourism tick uh, accreditations, uh, camp association accreditations. Typically, we've relied on those things. But what's happened, and we've had this conversation before, is that we've moved from what the intention of those ticks were to really it's just a business model. Um, and so insurers have zero confidence in any of those because the activities themselves are not specifically addressed. And if we say, oh, you must comply with the AAS, that's great, but they don't demonstrate how those things are complied. And the insurers are now looking into that detail. So the answer um, to, to Robert's question, which is a good one, is the answer is yes. Uh, has it resulted in reasonable premiums? Well, the, at the moment, uh, it's, it's resulting in availability. Uh, price is actually not the issue. Yeah, right. And I think, I think, Paul, what you said there, it's the ability to demonstrate the compliance with the AAS that, that people are, are finding difficult. I, I'll just use an example like staffing within, within the AAS. There's, there's a lot of people with experience that do have the competencies. Mm -hmm. um, the AAS talks about you've got your, from the national training package and, and the units of competency required to run certain activities. So that is a way if a person has a qualification, that competency has been assessed and then they just have to be sort of, I guess, we're simplifying it here, inducted into the business and, and we're complying there. Where we've got people that just have experience, it talks about linking back those competencies to the package and being able to demonstrate that. And, and business is finding that very difficult to do. Um, submissions that you get, this person has five years experience. Yeah. What is that experience? What have they done? What skills? And that's do just yeah, and that's just in one specific detail. But in general, those sorts of same gener generalities are still apply. If I put my small business hat on and, and I suppose put myself in some of our operator's shoes, and they hear that you know they've got to have processes and procedures and and everything like that, and I think the overwhelming thought is they need war and peace. <laughs> or, you know, something that's going to stand up to a lot of scrutiny. Is that the case? Or, I mean, is it as simple as, you know, some safe work method statements? And, yeah, what does it look like? 
I think you've nailed something there. Everything should be scaled to, to the business. But um, the key thing is not how big it is or how long it is. It's whether it will stand up to scrutiny. That, that actually is the real question. And so the insurers, see, see for a one-man operation versus a 200-employee operation, the $20 million uh, capital adequacy under Australian law still has to be met. So they've still got to meet those those capital adequacy standards for the one-man operation versus the big one. Um, uh, the, it's got to stand up to the scrutiny, so it's got to be relevant to what you do. Um, mm -hmm. There's lots of assistance there, but you know the AAS are, are written in such a way, for example, that are inclusive of all of that type of thing because we do know the industry. But mm -hmm. but you can't use the excuse, oh, there's just one of me, um, you know, and and so as an excuse for having something little when if you're whitewater rafting um just one of me won't cut it so oh. so you still have to you still have to scale it to either the, the, the your operation but also to the activities that you're undertaking but even in the scalability of operation there's still core documentation like a risk assessment an operating procedure an emergency and incident response plan once you start then getting into larger operations it's, and maintenance and inspection, once you start getting into larger operations, it's how have the staff been inducted and trained in all of those business processes uh, because you've got a lot more moving parts and how is there the, I think the word is accountability. You might have a great, a great business leader that's got uh, very high quality skills, qualifications, ticks the box. But if that isn't able to flow down to the rest of the staff, yeah. that's where I think uh, people are having a little bit of difficulty. Yeah, but Rob's got a question there. Rob, do you want to um, jump in? I guess more of a, um, uh, a note to, to the Outdoors New South Wales. I mean, yes, it's it's insurance related, but it's it's that uh, piling on top, one on top of the, everything else for a one man band operation or a one lady operation. If say for nature play, if you're only trying to, um, you know, do a little bit, um, but you have, need with the war and peace, you need all the insurances, you need all the procedures. It, you know, it gets so piled up that you know your your costs would be, you know, your fixed costs would be over fifty thousand dollars that you have to attain before you even make any money for that year, and that's the same for, well, any any one man band operations, and and most of them that I've talked to have said, well, I, if, if everything was taken care of, all the office work and the paperwork and the marketing was taken care of, I can do a really good job. I can give a good experience and, and do it all safely, but mm. I have to be in the office half the time. So, I mean, it's yeah. just a side note to insurance, but as I say, the pile on to, of, of uh, reading the procedures, following them through, yes, there's complexities for a, a 200 person operation, uh, more vehicles, more procedures, more meetings, more uh, accommodation and all that palaver. But mm. for the smaller, and you know, so my point being for the outdoors New South Wales industry, um, we need the small operators, but how do we make it streamlined enough for them to stay in business? Because, you know, one insurance uh, insur lady, has, her insurance went from $1,500 to $7,500 and that she couldn't make enough money to justify that. Um, so close it down um, yeah. as well as all the other, well, like I said, you know, making a living. If you're doing 110% of your time, putting your effort into it, but you're only making a 30% wage, um, it's, it's hard. And Rob, just on the sideline, Laurie, I think that's actually really critical involved in that decision is that unfortunately what's happening is yes the industry is allowing insurers to start to drive what's required and and that that i say that unfortunately because it's totally skewing the opportunities um not not just for businesses to survive but to actually engage young people especially but people of all ages um of getting into the outdoors so, you know, there, there's, a, there's a huge implication to yeah. getting people uh, who don't know what, what goes on to influence what goes on. So what you're saying is that um, 
the the industry is allowing the insurance company to be more scrutinising. Is that what you're saying? Sorry, I miss. I'm... Well, what I'm saying is that 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 in the absence of industry driving things, the insurers will drive it. So. Yeah. Yeah. like we used the example, they will say, this is the standard, this is what we expect, and premiums will reflect it. Because I, I think in a way, Robert, what you're saying is we need to also lobby to make sure that we as an industry can mm. demonstrate that we're capable of managing this. Yeah, yeah. Without the palaver. It's like I've set you both up as a segue to what I was going to announce from outdoors New South Wales, but I haven't. I haven't said anything. Um, but that you're exactly right, and I suppose that's why I said before, if I put my small business hat on, and to Helen's point, you know, a one-lady operation, she's got a lot of decisions she has to make, as Rob does as a one-man operation, about where he concentrates his efforts. And we are made up of small business. And, and, you know, as I've said before, a lot of my work has been working with small business to look at the choices before them and to make the informed choices for the best outcome for the business. So we're taking a step back. Um, and I mentioned before that Outdoors New South Wales and ACT is looking at a auditor panel. Now, what this is set up to do is to get some very experienced people that know the AAAS and the good practice guides, possibly be involved in their inception, uh, right through to implementation, et cetera, that have the ability to audit a business against the AAAS. So what this does is take away all that angst and, and time and effort that a business owner or one person operation has to do to sit there and go, okay, these are my operations, how does it compare? And it's your opinion. Um, what this can do is by having a panel of people that you could select from come into your business and look at your, your procedures and look at what you do and sit it against the AAAS and provide you a report back of this is what you need to do to be more compliant with the AAAS or align yourselves better. What that then does is give you a quick checklist of how to improve those procedures um, so that, you know, I mean, the, the end game, hopefully, is that you've got a lot more of a, a safer business, a more sustainable business, and one that you have put your energy and your time into where it's needed most versus uh, trying to tackle something like this. But what it can do is help in this process in gaining renewals with insurance. So does that make sense? Or is there any questions aligned with that panel? I think that makes sense, and uh, as we're you know, aware, you know, we're, we're, but when you look at Rob's comments about um, you know the one-person operation and stuff, that's where business mentoring. You know, we have that lack of the ability. If someone comes into the industry and they've got an idea, if they could sit down with somebody that all you know, was already in the game mm. and knew all the rules, well, hopefully knew the rules, uh, they could say, well, you have to be you know, have to aim over X amount of years to get this big to be to be worthwhile even starting it in the first place. Yeah. In other words, whether you're starting a coffee shop or an outdoor activity or whatever business it is, there is a there is a size you need to be to be worth doing, unless it's a hobby, as perhaps my business is. Uh, I mean, really I am only a small business. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I employ staff, but in many ways, I'm a one-man band operation. So I'm in, in a similar area. I reckon it's easier to be small than to be medium or big. Um, the time is getting the initial stuff set up, mm. yeah, your compliance uh, documentation and your systems, particularly if you're only running one or two activities. I run lots. Uh, and then after that, it's just keeping it updated. I think a small operation should be actually, uh, as the takeaway restaurant compared to the sit-in restaurant is finding the takeaways are making more money. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so if we were able to mentor some of these people, whether they're big little or otherwise, but particularly the new people or yeah. people struggling with the new, with the new world, I yeah. think there'll be a higher survivability. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, oh. I agree. Something, something to consider, and this we've seen work well in the horse industry um, on two, two separate fronts from an individual business level and a uh, association and club level. And this brings, uh, Dave and I spoke about uh, clubs 
uh, last week is that in, in the association world, a peak body gives credibility to its affiliated clubs. Say if you have a climbing association that has 20 affiliated climbing clubs throughout the country, um, they, they're running exactly the same activities. Their location may change, but the key risk management principles are the same, whether you're climbing at the Arapalis, the Grampians, the Blueys. So in terms of their risk assessments, their operating procedures, their training and induction, those are all able to be used by every club. So through their affiliation model, they affiliate with the national body and they're provided with the risk management documentation and inducted in using that documentation. What that means is then um, there's, that, there's that scalability, but for insurers as well, is if it's been, if that one document has been approved, it's giving credibility to all 20 organisations. And that's the way the horse associations work. And the same things happened within the horse businesses is there's say an organisation like Horse Safety Australia. Uh, they have a um, accreditation and a qualifications uh, model there through the national training package. As part of that, when they're members, they get access to um, risk assessments, operating procedures, uh, and, and, and the like through their accreditation. What that also makes it um, easier for the insurer then is if any of those businesses that have gone through that program, the insurer already knows that they're already at a minimum base standard because they've gone through that program and been provided with already vetted documentation, which then they tweak to their specific situation. So I think in, in, this, in this world, like whether you're running there's going to be a lot of rock climbing businesses out there. Maybe there is a pool of documents that sit with um, OCA, um, Outdoor New South Wales, ACT, Outdoors Vic, that any of those businesses as members can, um, can, can access, which then for the insurers, um, they've got a lot less overheads because they've already been pre-vetted so many times. Mm. That's where your AAS concept, Laurie, is is um, really refreshing, and, and and that will be welcome because again, it's industry driving it. Um, there's industry expectations. Um, the the risk you run is making sure, which the AAS have been really good at not doing. The risk you run is is making sure that you don't establish things on a, and this is the hard line of a of a, of a standard so low that everyone trips up as they run over <laughs> over it. Making sure that these. Um, the, the gap between minimum standard and best practice is not uh, too large because typically that's what it's done. There's, there's, a, um, still, there's still got to be credibility with it. But I, I think that, that coming from industry, that's huge. Mm, mm, absolutely. That's where it's yeah. critical that we review just... those standards in the next bit, yeah? Mm, yes, Dave, yeah. I was, I was just going to mention that um, from a small business perspective, uh, running different trips in different states, if I was just handed documentation about risk, it certainly wouldn't uh, cover the actual risk. I, I guess that's one of the real pitfalls in uh, businesses being handed documentation uh, is that they the process of the risk assessment is what's necessary to get to the outcome. So I'm not, you know, I'm not quite in agreement that, that handing small businesses that documentation is necessarily the best way to approach it. I completely agree. And, and Helen, you've nailed it. It's the process. So typically try to find, um, uh, you know, templates versus, um, more guidelines or, or, or more uh, uh, the pro, you know, assistance with the process rather than, oh, here's a document, you can put your name to it. It's actually trying to find help to get that. And, and I think you've just, you know, you've nailed it, but the, 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 that's often not going to be the case because some people want the documentation simply so they've got the documentation. They're not actually using the documentation for something that they can effectively refer to or, or, or align. Um, and and that's that's often comes from the immaturity of the people that, that have uh, that, that are involved in it because you know, mm. someone of your experience that that's natural that, that the paperwork is part of the process to deliver the quality product, whereas for many others uh, the paperwork is is 
is the end. It's the means to the end for you. Uh, for many, it's the end. Oh, good, I've got the paperwork. Uh, and, and that's unfortunately where we've been labelled to a degree because it's what's easiest. So it's finding a balance in there. Getting help to people uh, is definitely, that. that's more the referral of, uh, I guess, what Greg's referring to. But um, making sure it's a means to an end is really, really critical. I think that you've made a very good point. And the insurers are really, uh, that's why they're looking at and saying, okay, that's great. That's what they write down, but what do they do? Uh, three quarters of our work and three quarters of Greg's work before he jumped in, I'll save him the breath, mm -hmm. is actually trying to convince the insurer that, that uh, this is actually what they do. Because what they do is they'll go onto a website, they'll go onto your Facebook page and they'll say, well, they say they do this, but here they're doing this. You know, they say they've got safety on, but here's a bloke standing with no helmet, no no uh, clip-on standing on the, on the end of a pile. So we've got to then convince the insurer, well, that photograph or that video or that you know it is just a one-off and it's very hard to get some backwards of it so and, what and we do is critical and unfortunately um we've seen very large claims as a result of people having great procedures great training all of those things so we say okay we've done all of these things and it's an a plus business that's passed all of the checks then uh, they just decide ah oh, Today, we're not going to follow the procedure. Someone gets hurt, million dollars, see ya, thank you, goodbye. And we have seen things like that happening, which again, makes the insurers even more nervous when you have businesses that do demonstrate everything and things are still going wrong, which makes it very hard for them to manage and work out who is good and who is not. Rob, sorry, you've got another question. Yeah, I, I guess. Well, it's it's led right straight to that um, the point that he the, the the last two were just making is um, um, so for I've always been um, wondering as a small business when you say as an insurer as an insurance broker what, what is defendable what what can you prove or what what is it going to take to get you off a death or a an incident um, and an insurance or get covered. Um, so, I mean, tongue in cheek question, I guess, is, you know, are, are they defendable? Nothing's ever defendable in court. We know that. You'd, there's someone's always going to argue that, oh, the, here's a photo and it's only a one off year, but, you know, that's, that's the attitude that they've been doing for the last two or three years. So, I mean, uh, anecdotally, and I, you know, there's no one's done a study on this, I'm sure, but um, what are the chances um, that it is anything is defendable? I mean, the incident where two people, died up in the Blue Mountains or the lady died in a canoe unsupervised up in Lismore or something. What What's what's the outcome for a small business as you two as an insurance um, experts or brokers, um, you know, do companies actually even survive? Because, I mean, it'll cost a small company fifty to $100,000 to defend themselves, even though they're in the right. At, at, at best. Um... Robert, I can tell you from experience, and I can only talk to you about our insurer, and, and we also manage our claims in-house, so we are slightly different than, well, we're very different than any other operation, so I can only talk to how we do it, but um, I can say that um, we, have, um, we have been able to successfully defend claims, um, uh, and we have won, and we have lost some where uh, we've done everything right. Uh, it does come down to the judiciary. Um, the, the, the bottom line is, um, you know, we've got clients who have, have, by doing it through that process, making sure the insurer stands by you. Yes, there are a lot of businesses that have had claims where they have done things right. Things still go wrong. And I think that's very important to understand. That's actually what insurance is for. And the insurers actually budget for that. What they don't budget for is for all of the other things that are going on. So for example, I'll just sort of twist it slightly because because the answer is yes. And we've got lots of evidence of that. Um, but what what you've got now is all of a sudden the insurers, and, and I know it's time, so we'll, we'll finish up with this, but um, one of the things that, that they're now having to deal with is because of the business decisions that a lot of people in our industry have made, we're now faced with um, a lot of businesses are, are, are now using contractors. And now I, I wasn't I was going to say scam contractors, but um, that's not that's not a technical term, is it? Um, 
but but this whole thing with contractors is actually really out, now added to the exposure for the insurers. So as they've looked into it, they're saying, well, these guys aren't aren't employed; they're contractors. And and so what is the extent of our involvement with those contractors? And that's something that they're really they they don't accept in any other industry. Yet suddenly we're asking them to accept. And oftentimes those contractors don't work for anyone else except that person. So they still have, legally, they actually still have exposures. So you've now got two entities that have got insurance, one entity that doesn't have the procedures because they've actually got to inherit those of the other. And we've actually seen claims where we've got some instances where something's occurred and the, the operator has said, oh, but he's a contractor. That's his problem. He's got to do the induction. Well, but it's, uh, it's on your site and it's your equipment. So we, we have got so many gaps in our industry. Um, and I say our industry because this, this, the reason I'm sitting in this seat and working is because I've spent my life working in the outdoors industry. Um, so, you know, I, I really do have a lot of ownership with it. And, and so do most of our staff and, and what they're doing. You know, it, it, we keep seeing, thinking that insurance will fix things. Um, but we keep moving the goalposts. So as an industry, we really have to get some cohesion together and we have to start to getting solid on the directions because we keep moving the goalposts and, and the insurers can't keep up. So it's going to be easier for them to say, let's move on. Yeah. Sport is a classic example. No insurer wants to touch sport anymore because it's just too hard. Helen, do you want to talk to what you just threw up there? Yeah, I was just going to say, I, it's a screenshot of um, a clause from my latest insurance renewal. I use mostly contractors and it assumes that every contractor that I use has their own public liability uh, or what, you know, personal, in what is it? Um, uh, subcontractors liability insurance with a minimum level of indemnity of $10 million. So I'm using people who uh working freelance in the industry um for next to nothing and uh having to kind of get their own insurance just to work for 300 bucks a day mm, mm. um it, and I, I i'm not sure i guess I, I don't really have a question it's more of a it's it's just so difficult to kind of comply with all the regulations all the time but and get the right people to run safe trips, which is the most important criteria. <laughs> yeah. So so. I, I can, yeah, I can speak to that, Helen. So, so traditionally, like, and we look at the building industry, when you get a, build, a, a, a site manager running a building project, contracting, the, the core premise of it is to try and take risk off you and put it onto someone else. So that's the whole point of contracting to get risk. So. You employ, you contract the chippy, you contract the sparky. To, so if they screw up, it's on them and it doesn't affect you. And I think what the outdoor industry in a way has done is taken something that was to be used to remove risk and actually we've flipped it around to use it in another way. Now, historically then, all of the public liability insurances um, and all the wordings are written for... Um, directors, executive officers, employees of the business. Then they don't include contractors because the whole point of contractors is to remove risk. So no insurance policy is normally designed to cover contractors. Um, and that's why then the insurer is saying the contractors must have their own cover. So if they're employed, they're automatically covered under your policy. You don't have to do anything in a, in a normal sense because the employment arrangement has been <laughs> changed to a contractor it's knocked them out of the policy and I think this is an overall industry thing and I've had a discussion with a number of businesses about this the fact that the clients and the participants aren't willing to pay what is a viable rate so you can pay your staff a viable wage and you can cover your business costs when in reality um, if, if Paul and I mess up, people lose money. If someone messes up in an outdoor business, people are seriously injured and lose their lives. And unfortunately, outdoor providers are paid a lot less than people working white-collar jobs with probably a lot more consequence. 
And I think this is an overall industry issue in terms of business margins that Laurie's looking at at the moment is society doesn't actually value the service that you are providing in a way to make the businesses viable. And I think that's, that's probably the biggest systemic issue that sits below all of this that we have to work through as an industry. Absolutely, Greg. And just to that point, um, the other thing I haven't mentioned in today's session is where we've gone in, um, we proposed a bit of an outdoor leader certification program to see if we can look at some of these challenges in the industry. And um, what's resulted in that is there's so much voice out there, which is just awesome. So what we're doing now is harnessing that voice in, in uh, a bit of a working party to see where we can go with this. And Greg, you just pointed out something that keeps coming up, which we're looking at is, you know, the professionalism of, of the industry when it comes to staffing, rates of pay, conditions, and the disparity of such. So from what I've seen in very short time I've been here is one end of the spectrum versus the other end of the spectrum, to Paul's point before, massive gap, massive gap in what we represent as, a, as an industry. So how do we get that a little bit more closing the gap but also articulate what is best practice and what is going to set us apart as a sustainable industry and not one that relies on, on passion and enthusiasm to keep us going every day. Um, and that, yeah, what we were saying before, world peace, <laughs> trying to establish, you know, what that looks like, it, it is certainly a challenge, but we've got to start somewhere. And, um, and I think we're in a good position now to really start working on these issues. Um, Gemma, no. Bring it out here. <laughs> you find the dog rub or us? <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. I'm trying to drag a dirty, dirty cow bone into the house. I'm trying to drag a dirty cow bone into the house. <laughs> awesome. Um, any other questions? We've got eight minutes left, and obviously we have two amazing specialists at our Becca Call here uh, for some curly questions. If anyone wants to. I mean, yeah, Helen, is there anything else that's going to help you in this in this renewal period that you don't feel you're equipped with yet? Um, I guess pausing insurance uh, when you for, for times when you're not operating. So, for example, if I'm not operating for three or four months because I've got nothing scheduled, um, you know, is my my current insurer, I, I'm not able to pause my insurance at all. Um, it, you know, it, it, with other insurers, is there the option of, of pausing? With car insurance, with car insurance, for example, Helen, you, you can pause it because you, 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 there's, there's, a, there's a really strict regime in the car. And so it, it moves from here to here and just moves ahead. With liability insurance, basically the premiums are structured on a 12 month period. So if you work, um, let's say 10 units of time, over 12 months, your premium will reflect that, uh, plus whatever the minimum premium of things were. If, if you concentrate at all, say, say for example, um, you, know, you, you run uh, 100 people over 365 days, uh, and someone runs 100 people on one day, I'm just using that, and does the same activity, all of the risk is pushed into one spot. So should they only pay a smaller premium than what you do? So it's it, it basically uh, public liability is averaged out over 12 months uh, as to how it's going. So the pauses are actually should be built into to what what your output is. Unfortunately for small operators, the, the, the minimum premium aspect because of the financial implications of, as I said, the capital adequacy, there's, there's, a, there's a minimum premium that they will take because it costs them this much just to actually you know, fund the 20 million or the 10 million, whatever it is. Okay, thanks. I just thought I'd end with a bit of an analogy, which um, I think helps in understanding that businesses, as, as challenging as this seems, they, they really need to start and, and really need to look at this as an issue to try to help them going forward. And, and I relate it back to um, the tourism industry, which most of you know that I've come from, where we, we've had uh, an award structure for many years that we have hand on heart believed in because we've seen the results of what it has achieved. It is a very difficult award system to enter. 
it is a 30 page submission on average. It goes through all the different elements of a business and what it does by responding to those awards actually makes you review your business plan and that's how it is structured. Now, what I have seen in transition of businesses that have applied for these awards over years is a growth of their business, is a sustainable business and one that has accomplished so much with so much adversity um, because of the process they went through. Now, as I say, it's sort of a little bit similar in the fact that, you know, as much as we, and to Helen's point before, you don't want to be handed something and passively use it because that's not going to help your business. It might tick some boxes, but it's not going to help that business become the best risk management processes, the best business it can. So I think exactly to your point, taking probably tools, but making sure that it's very applicable to your business and working through that process. Now, that's where hopefully the, the audit system that we're going to implement will start that process. But that's where Outdoors New South Wales and ACT will certainly be there to help guide as well. And we'll work with members to make sure that their business practices are the best available for your activity and your outcomes that you're desiring. Um, everyone desires something different from a business and that goal will often part the way to where they need to go as well. So there's a lot of different factors in there, but I just wanted to say that, you know, it, it will take effort and we've got to accept that, but we have to start. And it's just getting that, that start platform. And I know Greg and I have been working on tools that we can help provide the industry, which is certainly work in progress. Um, but again, they are just tools. They are not the whole toolbox they are tools to help you build that box. Mm. And Laurie, just to, to encourage all of you, I appreciated, and I'm sure Greg, uh, you know, he, he appreciated your, your statement there, I, something along the lines of, you know, let me misquote you completely, you're two amazing experts or professionals. I, I really did appreciate that. I think what you've got to appreciate is that we actually see it the other way around. And, and as I look at the names that are on the screen now and you know, the, the experience that's sitting in, in this uh, call at the moment. Um, I, I hope that each of you see yourselves as uh, amazing experts and professionals. And this is the, this is, I think, it, we're, having worked for, with young people and in this industry for 40 plus you know, years, is, is getting them to actually um, recognise the professionalism of which they operate and the, the, the standing. As Greg said, you know, we, we deal with businesses and, yep, there's financial and, and, and obviously emotional implications to the, the things we do. Um, but, you know, in, in the past, the, the reason that we can be so diligent in what we try to do, and I'm sure we've let people down along the way, um, is that our background comes from having people's lives in our hands daily. And, and that's what all of you do. And I think seeing yourself as a professional seeing your industry as professional changes the, the, the whole uh, perspective. And that's something that we must continue to do. Um, the experience, um, the professionalism that's in, in this room, again, that's what's gonna take the industry forward. And the next generation have to see themselves as that too. So we, we have to set the bar high, we have to expect a lot, um, but we have to also have the ability to, to look inside and believe in, in, in who we are and what we do as being important as well. And I think in, with that skill and experience, there's just one thing I, I, I believe, and I'm sort of probably in, in, in between generations here, is a lot of the experience in this room has been gained by responding to incidents that should have happened. Seeing people seriously injured, killed, either in trips they've been involved with or trips they've been around them. What I want to see happen, and, and this is now me just talking personally, is that I don't want the next generation of outdoor leaders to have to be exposed to those things. I, want, I don't want the next generation of participants to be, have to be exposed to those things, that we can give them positive, safe, enjoyable, constructive, um, experiences in the outdoors so their experience can be I guess derivative from from ours not gained in the same way yeah brilliant Greg and, and uh, I'd love to summarize this whole session with what Paul said which is <clears throat> around getting industry to drive the response not being submissive to the requirements of, of others and 
Um, I think we're well started on that journey, but we've still got a long way to go. Um, so thank you everyone for attending. It's just turned 11. This is being recorded. So if you want to review it again or refer it to any of your colleagues, please feel free. Um, and we'll join you next week with um, Take 3 and the pilot project for the South Coast, North Coast and Central Coast. So if you're in those areas, make sure you don't, don't miss out um, on that session. So have a great week uh, next week and we'll see you all next Friday. Thanks everyone. Thank